All right, a few people drifting back from break that I'll, uh, I'll get going. My name is Richard Benwell, founder and CEO of Squared Up. Uh, you may not have heard of us before, but we are a data visualization company that's been working in the enterprise IT space for the last 10 years and just this month uh, released a, a new visualization platform that correlates data across your observability tools, your development tools, and your business tools. It's great to be here, and uh, today my talk is on why large-scale observability needs graph. And by large scale, I mean not necessarily the volume of data, but the complex, messy kind of systems that we're trying to observe uh, as we scale up our organizations. And by graph, I mean not the line graph type of graph, but the graph that is the connected things type of graph. Uh, so in the talk today, I hope to cover why I think uh, large scale observability needs graph. I'll cover what sort of graph is, how it's used today, and maybe some challenges for adoption going forward. When we talk about observability, we talk about metrics, logs, and traces, and uh, I think Bartek was saying there's maybe more than those three pillars, maybe there's six pillars, maybe, maybe, there's, a, maybe there's a lot of pillars, but uh, I'll use metrics, logs, and traces in this uh, talk. Often when we talk about this data, we really focus on how do I collect and store that data. And many of the talks today are about how we do that at massive scale, how we store that data at massive scale, and it's a huge engineering challenge. The other challenge, though, is how we use that data. Collecting that data doesn't necessarily actually offer any value to us. Just sitting in a database is only valuable if we can actually use that to answer questions. So how do we find and use the right data to answer questions like, where's the problem for this incident? Uh, how reliable are my components? Where's the weak spot? Uh, how's my application going to scale um, uh, with its performance? Uh, and if I make a change to one component, how is it going to impact other components? How do I plan change? And these are a very different kind of challenge, and I think the latter challenge, using the data, is still an unsolved challenge. We're still finding that our data is massively underused, and we're still finding it hard to answer, even maybe sometimes some straightforward questions. And so I think this is because we've been missing something when we've been talking about observability and what it needs. And to explain this, I'm going to bring up, I think, probably the Wikipedia page that everyone here has read. Is there anyone who hasn't read this Wikipedia page? <laughs> so the Wikipedia page on observability, um, it's, uh, you know, it's where the sort of inspiration for observability came from, was from the control systems domain. And so you, know, you go Google observability and you'll find this Wikipedia page. And up, right at the front, at the top, is the definition of observability that we're all very familiar with. Observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. So how do we understand what's happening given what we are uh, observing from the external outputs? So that's great. That's the bit we've taken from this Wikipedia page and we've put on every single blog about what is observability. It's where every single observability talk starts with that definition. And if you have been to this page, you've probably done like me the first time I got here, which was you, you read that and you think that's pretty cool. You maybe read some of the rest of the paragraph and then you start to scroll down and your eyes glaze over and your, your scroll uh, finger sort of kicks into action and you just scroll down the bottom of the page and, and move on. But I think there's more uh, to be inspired from, uh, from the control systems observability and that's uh, further down the page. So sort of the first, first instinct we have is collect, collect the data but actually we scroll down the page, we hit some of these equations, and again, most of us kind of glaze over and move on. And I'm not going to talk in depth about equations, this isn't going to be a maths session, um, but I did want to just talk about what those equations actually mean and, and what we can learn from them. So as we scroll down the page from uh, control theory and, and observability, it talks about whether a system is observable. And these two equations broadly mean the first one uh, is you know, the x dot, so kind of the new state of the system is a function of you know, the previous state of the system plus, uh, uh, plus the, the inputs. So you've got x dot equals ax plus bu, so u is the inputs and x is the current state of the system. So that's the first equation. How does the system change over time with inputs? And the second equation is what our outputs look like. Our outputs, our signals are some function of the current state of the system plus the, the inputs that are going into it. So that's what control theory talks about. Um, it has, has the idea of uh, the current state, uh, inputs and, uh, and those outputs. And then it talks about this observability matrix. So when in control theory they say, is a system observable? You need the outputs, sure, you need the signals, but you need something else. You need those, those matrices that define 
how a system works, right? How does the system change over time? How the output's a function of the state of the system. So in control theory, they have these matrices that define the model of the system. And that raises the question, where's our system model? So we're talking about collecting the data. We have the, the signals, the outputs, but where's our system model? How do we work out the internal state of the system? So just putting this sort of into context, um, if we take a control system uh, observability case, this is like a textbook case, what is the internal state of the system? Right, what's the voltage across this capacitor? Um, we know these, these signals. We've got a voltage across um, uh, the inductor there uh, and an input voltage. So what's, what's the voltage of C? Now, it's pretty obvious we have absolutely no idea because we don't know what circuit it's talking about. So in a control systems case, you have a circuit diagram, that's then modeled using those matrices, and you can find out whether we can, in fact, understand what the voltage across that capacitor is if we have these output signals, right? And so you put those into that uh, observability matrix equation and say, yes, it is observable. Given those outputs, we can figure out what's happening within that system. So very obviously, we need a model to interpret those voltages. Those voltages are meaningless without that model. So if we hop over to something that's a bit more familiar, our control, uh, so our software system observability, maybe a sort of a similar question, where's the problem, where's the faulting component? Um, we have our signals, the metrics, logs, and traces. We can't use those unless we have a model of the system, right? Just we, if we had a database full of metrics, logs, and traces, we wouldn't know what we're looking at. And often that is the case uh, in, uh, in organizations that the data is collected, but not many people actually know how to interpret that data. So, of course, we need a model as well, right? We have a, a model maybe of our microservice architecture or a model of our infrastructure and our clusters. So we absolutely need a model to interpret the observability data, the signals that we have. So we clearly do have some sort of model. Um, well, just, to, just as a recap there, sorry. You know, in, in terms of sort of asking the question, is our system observable? The, the proposition here is that actually we need the signals plus the model, right? We can't just say our system's observable because we're collecting the data. We need to put that data into context with the model. So clearly we do have a model of some sort because we do use this data. It's not absolutely useless to us. So where is the model typically? Well, the model typically is in someone's head or in our, in our heads in, in terms of informal knowledge. Maybe it's written down in a confluence page that's out of date or an out of date diagram, but it's probably just informal knowledge shared within a team and across teams. Now this is absolutely fine if you're a two pizza DevOps team, right? You build it, you run it, you know, you know what's going on, everyone knows how the system works, you know how to interpret all this data. But as you scale and become multiple teams and you're not just a single system, you're, you're a system of systems, where's the model of the system of systems, who in their head understands how it all fits together. And that's when you start to see the pattern of something like an architect whose kind of job it is to work out how everything fits together, everything comes to them. Or maybe the unlucky SRE who's like really trying to figure out how everything fits together and so all questions come to them. So that scales so far, right? You, you, you get maybe a few people who have this knowledge and understand the model and so know where to, to look and interpret that data. But at some point, in a large-scale application, you get to this level of complexity. So this is the, the infamous uh, AWS Death Star. So when they mapped out their microservices, they ended up with, uh, with a diagram that looks something like this. Where's the knowledge of that? How do we interpret all of that data and put it into context when we have a system of that sort of complexity? Now, of course, we're not all necessarily like that. We don't have sort of massively uh, complex systems like that. But if you have if you work in an organization that's been around for a few years and has gone through technology platforms, has gone through developers, gone through scale, you will have a messy system with a lot of uh, different dependencies that are probably not written down anywhere. And that's why it's so hard to use that data that we collect is we're not quite sure where to look when things go wrong or how to interpret the data that we have. So, Suggestion here is that we need, a, we need to store a model if we're going to use our data and have true observability. So how do we capture, store, and use a model? So that's why I want to talk about graph. I think the model is a graph. And like I said in the intro, when I say graph, I don't mean the sort of line chart type graph. I mean the graph of connected things. Uh, these two uh, diagrams are actually just from the Wikipedia pages, so line chart, 
on the left and uh, social graph on the right. So if you look up Wikipedia for social graph, that's what you see. And of course, we're all quite familiar with that idea of a graph, the social network graph, you know, interconnected things. And very clearly, this uh, maps very well onto uh, our domain uh, with our services that maybe call another service or maybe even that service uh, uh, puts a message onto a, a Kafka topic, so it publishes to a Kafka topic, and maybe another service subscribes to that Kafka topic, so they are, they are related and they have those relationships. Maybe that service is hosted on a particular cluster, maybe those clusters have particular hosts in them. It's all a lot of connected data, uh, and graph is the way to, to model that data. So before I go on, I wanted to do a couple of quick slides on sort of graph 101, just so we kind of all understand what, what graph is. Uh, it's a, a technology, I think, that's uh, trending quite a lot at the moment, and we're sort of seeing it more and more, and I'll talk about how we are starting to see it uh, in our observability platforms today. So the graph concept is this idea of, you know, the two dots and a line, right, the boxes and lines. Um, so we have two nodes with a link in, in, in sort of mathematics graph terms. They're called vertices and edges, which I never get used to. Um, so I kind of often call them just sort of nodes and links. And so we have something like service A called service B. Okay, so we can capture that relationship as a, as a graph of two, uh, two nodes there. And then just... Um, so slightly academic, but just to, to demystify some terms you hear, you then start to hear about something called a property graph and a knowledge graph. And so a property graph is, again, something very familiar. Um, it's when we have those nodes um, with relationships. So service A calls service B, but we start to add properties to both the nodes and potentially the edges as well. So we can add the label of that service. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called service A. It's owned by team, team alpha. It's in this particular repo. And we can put properties on the, the links if we want to as well. So we can mix properties and edges and just sort of kind of easily express what we want to express. And then just to, as I say, um, demystify a term if you've heard it, there's also this term called knowledge graph that's being used more and more. And you may have heard about it from Google's knowledge graph. So now when you Google something, instead of just getting web pages as results, you get that sidebar, that knowledge panel that actually knows what you're interested in and starts to give you facts about what you're interested in. It could be a, you know, a person, a famous, famous person, or it could be the, um, the results of the, the football match last night. So Google used something called a knowledge graph, and it's, it's slightly academic, um, uh, but it, the idea really is you sort of blow apart that graph to mean that everything is expressed as this subject predicate object. So instead of having properties on a, on a node, um, you say, well, that node has repo, and the, the identity of the repo is a separate node, and it's owned by a team, and that team is a separate node, and it also calls you know, another service, and that service is a separate node. It's a little bit like how we normalize a, a, relation, a relational database. You blow everything apart and put everything in its own space. And so within this sort of idea of knowledge graph, everything has a, a URI, um, a unique resource indicator, uh, and those identifiers can be then shared across different domains, and that's how you start to link data together. So when Google build their knowledge graph, they ingest all this data from different places, but they correlate it all using these, these URIs. This sort of is very exciting, this idea of, like, could you express every fact in the world as a, as a graph? That's pretty cool. What could you do with it if, if you could? Um, unfortunately, though, it's typically very sort of academic. Uh, it has the feeling of um, XML web services and, uh, and sort of SOAP, if you ever, ever worked with those back sort of, kind of, sort of 20 years ago. Um, so it feels a little bit too academic, not very practical, which is why the property graph is, is generally um, how graphs are used today. And just sort of another couple of aspects of graph. Uh, just so you know um, uh, these terms, if you hear about them, just as a popular databases around graphs. First is AWS have um, Neptune, so that's their gra uh, graph database. You have Azure, who has uh, Cosmos DB, which is a multi-purpose graph, um, but, but can act as a graph database. And um, the open source world is dominated by Neo4j, uh, which uh, one of the earlier uh, graph databases now used uh, very, very widely. So if you come across those databases and talk about graph, that's what they do. And you get something like this as an example query. They're very powerful if you've got all this data connected. You can ask questions like, what upstream front ends use this particular microservice? So within larger organizations, I've heard this several times, you're a development team developing a particular component. You don't necessarily even know how that component is being used by all the applications within your organization. You don't necessarily know who is calling you and what, what end user applications you're part of. 
So the uh, Amazon Cosmos DB both use Gremlin. I think Neo4j supports Gremlin as well, but they, they have their own um, uh, language called Cypher. And you can see there, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit complex, but it's um, this sort of idea that you can express a query like that um, in this language. You know, G uh, represents the graph, V is those vertices. And then you just say, hey, I'm looking for a service that has the name service X, and I'm going to iteratively look at the incoming uh, links to that, those services uh, with a calls relationship until I find a, uh, a node that has type front end. And then I'm gonna map those out. So super powerful once all this data is connected. So that's graph. How can graph be used to model our systems that we're trying to observe? The good news is, is that it already is. Not necessarily in the form of those databases, but in terms of concepts, graph is already being used within many observability tools. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to, to talk today about this topic, because it is just a, uh, a concept and a technology that is seeing a sort of increased uh, adoption. And I think as, a, uh, as a, um, a community, we should look at how we can formalize that uh, and really accelerate its, its adoption. So one system I wanted to quickly talk about is probably the most familiar, uh, Jaeger. Uh, when we uh, perform our tracing, ostensibly that's to allow us to identify you know, performance issues with a particular transaction or type of transaction. Uh, but typically, I, th I think one of the greater benefits is when it's first run is you understand what's talking to what. And you end up with this graph and go, aha, I didn't realize that actually you know, this microservice is actually being called by so many other different services. So in Jaeger, they have a graph view, and this is the, the graph you get, but it's just a, a visualization at the moment. That's not stored uh, anywhere, but it is one of the most sort of useful um, outputs uh, of these traces. The other use of graph uh, that you may be less familiar with is in a tool called Backstage. Uh, is anyone here familiar with Backstage? Yeah, just, just uh, maybe a handful. So Backstage, actually have Backstage Con just a few doors down the hallway. Uh, for the first time. Uh, it's a uh, Spotify project that was open sourced uh, a few years ago uh, and is now in the incubator uh, phase of, uh, of the CNCF. And it, it grew, it sort of came into life within, within Spotify by a sort of platform engineering team there saying, well, we really think we need to understand what we have and how it all works together, right? Effectively the model. And they didn't know what to call it at the time. They called it System Z or System Z. Uh, and it, it allows uh, developers to effectively catalog their services and metadata about those services, including then what services they depend on in a service catalog. So those, those definitions are defined normally in the code repo. Backstage pulls in the YAML files from different code repos, stores it in a centralized catalog, and enables you to, to map out your, um, uh, your entire environment. It's not specific to any particular infrastructure technology or, or sort of deployment style or application style. It is just a service catalog. Um, you might hear Backstage also called a development, developer portal. Uh, I, sort of, I think it's got more use as a, as a service catalog than a, than a developer portal. But again, um, the, the guys within uh, Spotify weren't quite sure what to call it, which is why they call it System Z. But, but it's a, a very powerful concept, which is a, a service catalog that allows you just to dump all this metadata about your services and what they talk to into, in a single place. And so this is starting to provide people with a, with a model of what's going on. Uh, when I saw backstage within Spotify, they um, did have a demo of how they actually imported Jaeger, the output of Jaeger traces into backstage as well. So you could actually spot anomalies or discrepancies between what your developers were declaring as their dependencies and actually what the dependencies were uh, when you're looking at the, the code running uh, 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 for real. And it's kind of an interesting use case, right? So, so do your developers really know what's calling them and, and, and what applications they're part of? So graph is already being used to, to, to model systems, certainly sort of conceptually. And I just wanted to also present on a couple of uh, examples of where it's being used to combine you know, those signals with the model. Uh, I think backstage is, is very exciting. And, you know, so it's just, just down the hallway there, I think there is great potential to combine what backstage are doing with, with what we're seeing here in the open uh, observability um, uh, community. But a couple of examples of how we can then correlate observability data across services using tools like this. Uh, one is Kiali on top of Istio service mesh. So this is specific to, to Istio. But this is a really nice example where they use the Prometheus data uh, to understand uh, what services are connecting to what other services uh, with the, um, 
uh, with Envoy there just tracing all in, in incoming and out, uh, outgoing uh, calls. They can map, uh, create that map. And then they overlay on top of that other Prometheus data, so you, including, uh, including alerts. So you can see the data in the context of your, uh, your service map and the, uh, the performance metrics as well. Uh, and I think Bartek also mentioned about uh, Prometheus maybe having something similar as well. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing that. So starting to combine the model with the observability data, I think really produces some, some powerful results. And I kind of one very uh, far end of the, uh, the scale of how we could use it. I just wanted to highlight a uh, project that was internal to uh, eBay, something called Groot. Uh, there's a white paper, and I think, uh, I think it may have been open sourced. There's a, a, an event graph based approach for root cause analysis. It's a little, little small on the screen there, but this idea is saying okay, if we have on the left our dependency graph that we've got from either sort of declarative or, or, uh, or sort of tracing, and then we overlay on top of that the events that are going on within our system, uh, then we can actually understand causality. We can understand that uh, an issue uh, or an, an event that occurred on some service has impacted some upstream service that's impacted a customer by correlating events across, across different tools. So there's definitely, definitely scope for, uh, for using this in uh, some very powerful ways and starting to, to make, uh, make use of all that observability data we're collecting. I want to just to finish with um, some uh, ideas around like how can we, you know, how can we use this this, this sort of concept further, how can we adopt this, uh, and how can we do more with our data? Uh, the first one is um, about extending the scope of observability. So as I say, we're, we're talking a lot about metrics, logs, and traces, and typically that's because we're focused on the system, as we define it, as our software. Like, what is the software doing? What is the code doing right now? Or perhaps the, the infrastructure that code is running on. But really, that software system is just running within a, a larger system that we really do care about. I've called it here the, the business system, but kind of two elements of that. One is when we're looking at how our software is performing, we shouldn't be looking at that in isolation of what the business is actually doing and cares about or what our customers are experiencing. If we're just looking at the performance of the code, then we're, we're really blinkered to, to the bigger picture. So really, as a system, in terms of modeling the system, we should be thinking more broadly than just our code. We should be thinking about the business that the code is running within. So for example, is the business hitting certain KPIs like conversions or adoption or revenue? Uh, or are the you know, customer events something that we need to observe as well, like logons, purchases, service tickets even? That's what we should really be thinking about as our, as our system that we're trying to observe, not just the code. And on the other side, very importantly, as we all know, things break often because of changes. So when we're talking about the system that we're trying to observe, we really need to include in that de the development teams, like pipeline deploys, code changes, the issues that they're, they're tracking and fixing. And of course, our third party dependencies, our external dependencies, the cloud providers that we're running on, some external API that we're, that, that we're depending on. You know, and we need to understand the status of that, potentially even cost as well. Uh, that's another, another aspect of observability. So when we're thinking about observability in the model, the system we're trying to model, we really should think beyond just the software. We should look at it in the context of the broader system. And again, that's where Graph can really help us because we're trying to find answers really by connecting the dots across everything that's going on. So for example, if we have a customer impacting incident, that might be recorded in a, uh, our service desk tool. And we might know which customer it is and, and has some information about that, that, that ticket. And of course, you know, it, first question we might ask ourselves is where do I look, where's, where's the problem? But often within a large organization, it's not so much about where do I look, it's like who do I get involved? I don't want to now, A, have to go and get you know, some architect who understands how it all pieces together, uh, and B, have to try and pull in multiple dev teams uh, and take them off what they should be doing, which is delivering you new features and value to try and resolve this incident. So by correlating that data across multiple different tools and domains, you know, we should more easily be able to relate something that's happening on the customer front with what our dev team are doing and changes happening to our system. And then just the sort of final uh, point in terms of adoption, I've talked about a number of different tools that are really either uh, defining graphs, creating graphs, perhaps consuming data in graph form. Uh, but right now we don't have a way of connecting these things. 
Uh, and that's very frustrating, given, given the, 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 the whole idea here is that we should be able to extend that graph from one tool and one domain across multiple tools and multiple domains, and that's when really we start to see the big picture. So, for example, you know, taking a, a, our service catalogs in backstage with the data we're seeing from our observability platforms, with our dev systems like our CI/CD pipelines uh, and Jira, and then even sort of you know, platform resources. We've got Azure Resource Graph. We have AWS. How can we stitch this all together? So, potentially, at a future Open Observability Day, hopefully, we can be talking about a, uh, an open standard for something we might be calling the observability graph that allows us to, to really start to make sense of all this data that we're collecting. So that's all I, I had. Just to, to recap, um, observability needs signal and model. Models are graph. Graph's already in use today across a number of tools, but we should be thinking about extending the scope of what we think about as observability. We can use that to connect the dots to find those answers, and do we need an open standard for for the observability graph. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Um, if you do have questions, I think we might have a few minutes. Otherwise, grab me in the hallway. I'd love to, to talk to you about this uh, if you're interested. Thank you.